begin reading in verse number 45 through uh, verse number 51, and I'm sure it's a familiar story with all of us here. And the Bible tells us that straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto the Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. Look back with me at the last part of verse number 48. And your King James Bible says this uh, phrasing here. It says, would have passed by them. I want to preach to you on this subject tonight for just a few moments. When Jesus would have passed by. When Jesus would have passed by. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I sure am thankful for the opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk. And Lord, uh, we've talked several times about this, and I believe it's a message that you've laid upon my heart. So please, would you empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit? Lord, I don't want to say anything of self, but I want everything to come from you. So Lord, would you please set aside any preconceived ideas that I have or anybody in here has. Lord, you just let us get in touch with you tonight. We need you. Lord, would you be with our preacher as he's at the Cornerstone Baptist Church in Farmington Hills? Would you give him safety? Would you be with that church this week? I hope that they'll be encouraged and strengthened uh, by having the tent meeting and that they'll go on another year. And Lord, we're sure thankful for all the many things that you did even today in the house of God. Would you just be with us tonight? Help us to honor and to glorify your name. God, would you please, please be with me. I need you tonight in your precious and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you uh, very much for standing. Uh, to give you a little bit of background into this story, and I'm sure we're all familiar with it, we see here Jesus has just performed the great miracle by, fi by feeding 5,000 plus with five loaves and two fish. And after performing this miracle, the crowd actually gets together, and you can read the account uh, of this story in Matthew chapter number 14, here in Mark chapter number 6, and also in John chapter number 6. And each man tells the story a little bit differently, although it's the same. They tell the story with a little more detail, some of them. And so, if you were to look over, and I think it's Matthew 14, you would see that the crowd, after seeing the miracle that Jesus Christ had just performed by feeding so many, actually, Brother Jeff wanted to take Jesus and make him king because they believed him right then and there. So you know what Jesus realized? Jesus realized, i got to get away because there's many more things that I have to perform before they recognize that I'm the king. Although it was great. And can you imagine Jesus as he knew their thoughts? This is God. This is God in flesh. This is a man, Jesus. 100% God and 100% man. And as he reads their thoughts and knows what they want to do, they want to take him and make him king, Jesus has to step back. And so we find here Jesus sends his disciples away and he goes up into a mountain to pray. If you were in Sunday school, the messages fit hand in hand how pastor was talking about how we need to trust the Lord and how we need to seek God's face whenever we want to make a decision. So we see here God himself goes to his, Jesus goes to his heavenly father and just talks to him, Brother Jeff. He didn't let himself get filled with pride. He stepped back from the moment. Hey, sometimes the world wants to set us on a pedestal and we need to step back before we become filled with pride. And so he's up in a mountain and he's praying. So we see he's up there and he's alone with God. But before that, hap or after, before that happens, he gives a command to his disciples. Look at it in verse number 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship. Constrained literally means to command. He told his disciples, you need to get into this ship and you need to go to the other side. God gives us many commands in the Word of God. I'll share a few of them with you today. We're all Christian. Hey, it's Sunday night. We all know God's commands. Number one, God's command. He commands us to go to church. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as uh, so much the more as you see the day approaching. We don't need to back up from going to church. We need to press forward from going to church. 
God wants you in your spot at church. I want you in your spot at church. You say, why do you want me in my spot at church? Because you encourage me. You encourage me by being here. You don't know what somebody else is going through. And the fact that you just being here encourages them. So we see Christ commands them to get into the ship. Sometimes God's commands don't really make sense to us, but we need to just do them. We need to just do them, excuse me. Next I see a command, we need to go soul winning. Man, I don't always like going soul winning. I'll be honest with you, Brother Jeff. Last, or two weeks ago, my wife got her, uh, a door slammed in her face. I really didn't like that. And it really, really, really discouraged me. It extremely discouraged me. The past two weeks, Brother Chris, each door, the first door that I've gone up to, there's been a snake that's gone across the sidewalk. I hate snakes. And it's that dirty devil trying to get me to not go soul winning. I know that it is because I hate snakes. And each door I go up to, there's that slithering anaconda. The thing's about 14 feet long and it's slithering across. It can eat me in one bite. But as I go out, you get discouraged, but the Bible tells me that I have to go. Mark 16, 15, we all know it. And he saith unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We know that that word preach there simply means to proclaim the gospel to every living creature. I don't like some of God's commands, and neither do you, but we're commanded to do them. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse number 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. That's hard to diminish God's commandments when He says that. You know why? Because I love Him. And I don't want to hurt Him. I don't want to do Him any harm. And if, if that's the simplest thing that He asks of me, I think I can do it. God asks me to give Him 10% and I keep the 90. That's a blessing. You say, well, are you going to be out of God's will if you don't tithe? Uh-huh. Are you going to be out of God's will if you don't go soul winning? Yeah. Are you going to be out of God's will if you don't go to church? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's tough. And that's hard to swallow. But those are God's commandments. And if we want to know the will of God, we have to do the will of God. And sometimes I don't like those things. But we have to do them. So we see here, He commands His disciples to get into, the other, to get into a ship. His disciples don't know what they're about to go through. They just saw an absolute miraculous miracle that God performed. He fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, Brother Jeff. That's amazing. Nobody that's ever walked this earth has ever, ever done that before except Jesus Christ. And after seeing that miracle, they don't want, would you want to leave Jesus? I wouldn't want to leave Jesus. I don't want to stick with it. I'd be like glue on that guy. I'd go anywhere he would go. But as he commands his disciples to go to the other side, things get rough from there, Brother Jeff. Look at verse number 47 with me in verse number 48. And when the even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. So number one, I see the command. He commands his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side. And as they're toiling and rowing, secondly, I see it's contrary. Sometimes in our Christian life, things are not going to go the way that we want them to go. It's going to go contrary to what we thought. I believe it was Brother, uh, Brother Wheeler who preached a message on the lines of that. Not everything we think is going to happen is going to happen. And sometimes we set our expectations too high and we get ourselves down and low because that didn't happen. Well, our tent meeting didn't go on for 12 weeks. Well, 28 27, 28, 30 people got saved. Praise the Lord for that. We saw a couple uh, last week get saved because their children started riding the bus. I said to the junior church children today, I said, you ought to thank Brother Chris. I said, did you realize while you're at home sleeping, he's out working, he gets up at midnight and he drives a truck uh, all the way to Indiana and he comes back day after day after day and then he gets up early on a Sunday when he could sleep in and he drives a bus and picks you up. I said, thank him. You see, there's fruit from his labor right there when those two got baptized. And we can rejoice in that, but we also ought to be thankful for that. Brother Chris, you do not have to drive that bus, but you do. And I'm thankful for it. There's a lot of people that do things in this church that they wouldn't have to do, but they do it out of love. And God blesses that. So we see, sometimes it doesn't go the way that we want it to go. Sometimes things go contrary to the way that we want them to go. So we see His disciples miraculous miracle that they just went through and Christ tells them to get into a ship 
They're thinking, okay, we'll get into the ship and we'll go to the other side. Nothing will happen. Everything will be just fine. Not so. As Christ is praying on the mountain, Christ already knowing what, would get, what was going to happen, Brother Jeff, as He's praying to God, He looks up and He just sees His disciples out there rowing and toiling. If you look over, and you don't have to turn there, if you look over in the book of John, John must have been a more detailed man. He must have been a more of a thinker, I would say. Because in the book of John, chapter number 6, he tells us, uh, John said that we rode about 25 or 30 furlongs. Now a furlong in Jewish culture was seven and a half furlongs made up a mile today. So if we were to do basic math, they would be about four miles out. Now they were on the sea called the Tiberias Sea. And the Tiberias Sea, they say, is about uh, just short of 10 miles long. So we see that they left at evening, and now we're at the third watch, which would be between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., and they're halfway across the sea, and they're just going in circles. Nothing's happening. We're just, they're just going in circles, and Christ looks over, and he sees them just going in circles. Just absolutely, the winds are uh, hitting them and the, and the waves are coming into the boat and the lightning and the thunder and the storm is crashing in on them. But can I tell you that even though that the storm was crashing in on them, there was somebody who was looking over them and that was called Jesus. Can I tell you today, sometimes it feels like when we're in a storm, Christ is not with us. But can I tell you, just like uh, with the disciples, he's up on that mountain and he's watching over you and he's praying for you. I believe that Jesus was up on that mountain and maybe he said, oh God, you know that they're going through a storm right now and maybe they don't know what to do. And God said, hey Jesus, you know what to do. And as he's up there praying, he sees that it's not going the way that they thought it would go. Ah, that happens so many times in my Christian life where things absolutely go contrary to the way that I thought they would. So we see it's, they're about four miles out there. And man, they're rowing. And they're just getting more and more tired, Brother Jeff. More and more tired. The Bible says in verse number 48, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. This is Jesus. Do you remember when the men were walking on the road to Emmaus? And they, they were telling Jesus, who they didn't know was Jesus, that he had just died. He realized that it was him. And as he listens to them, they continue to walk, and he, he, begins, to, he begins to expound things upon them. And their eyes start to get a little bit open, but things are still dim. They're still down in the dumps and discouraged. And as they continue on, as our pastor has put it uh, before, they finally get to the end of the road. And they've gone to their house, these two men and Jesus. And old Jesus, he's standing there, maybe doing one of these, maybe whistling. Well, fellas, uh, I guess I'll carry on uh, my way this way. And as those guys would say, hey, wait, come in here and eat with us. Are you hungry? Come have a meal with us. They liked him so much. There was something in, inside of them that was burning. And it says, after he ate with them, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? That was holy heartburn. Man, there was something different about this guy. But Jesus never pushes himself on anybody. So we find here that he's walking on the water and he would have passed by them. He said, I don't know what they're doing. Oh, ye of little faith, but I'm going to the other side like I told you to do. I'm just taking a different route than you. So as he's walking by in the middle of a storm, this is Jesus walking on the water in a storm. His disciples look out, they see him, and they cry out thinking that it's a spirit, Brother Jeff. And he says, whoo don't fear, guys. So secondly, I see it was contrary. Third, I see the calm. Look at verse number 49 through verse number 51 with me. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Imagine with me, this is Jesus Christ. These guys are in the middle of a storm. 
it seems like their life is caving in. It seems like uh, th th they have, they've been working and toiling for hour after hour on this same sea, not getting anywhere. Halfway across, which should have taken them maybe a couple hours just to get across. And we see Jesus says to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. This is Jesus. Can you imagine the calmness that came over them when they heard those words? Boy, when Jesus speaks to you, you hear. Pastor was talking about it this morning. Do you know His voice today? You know, there's some times where I'm going through things in my life and it seems like everything is discouraging and oh, the world's against me and this and that. And the Lord has to remind me, not everything is going to go the way that you thought it was going to go. Some things are going to go contrary. And He says those few things and it seems like everything is called by then. Because He speaks in such... He's so profound and He's so eloquent and just the way He says things, you can listen to Him and it will calm you. In the storm of life, Jesus is speaking to us. Are we listening to Him? See, His disciples were looking for Him, Brother Jeff. They were looking for Him because the Bible tells us He would have passed by them. But His disciples had to make the effort to call out to Him to come over and to help them. Even though they were scared, even though they didn't have the faith that they should, they still called out because they knew there was something different about that guy. There was a glow about him. They thought it was a spirit. There was something different about him. And they called unto him. So thirdly, I see the calm. In the calmness of life, there's three things that are going to calm. Number one, if we're ever going to be calm, we need to have Christ. It's right there in verse number 48, the last part would have passed by them. That's Christ. We need to have Christ if we're ever going to have calmness. Secondly, you need to cry out to Him. Had they not said anything, had they let Him continue to walk by, had they just let Him go, they would have never had the calmness that they could have had that He could have given them. Because the Bible tells us He would have passed by. See, He wanted them to want Him. God never forces Himself on anybody. And that is the hardest thing. Me and Brother Eric were out soul winning during the tent meeting. And we got to witness to two people, Brother Hawk, two people, and they didn't accept. That's discouraging. That's tough. Because, and I said to Brother Eric, I said, you know, the gospel is not about me forcing anything on anybody. But sometimes I wish it was. I wish I could grab him and say, you need to get saved. There is a hell. There is a heaven. And you can put off going to hell, and you can go to heaven to be with somebody who died for you, who loves you, who wants you to, to be with Him. And I can't. I can't force Him into anything because God never forces Himself on anybody. And as He's walking upon the sea and He's about to pass by His disciples, these are the guys that eat with Him. These are the guys that have uh, been around campfires with Him. These are the guys that saw the miracles that He performed. And as He's walking by them, He's thinking uh, in the back of his mind, please call out to me. Please call out to me. I can save you from this trouble. I can save you from the heartache that you're about to go through. Yeah, this storm is really bad. This storm's really bad, guys. But if you call out to me, I can really help you. And as he's walking, maybe he goes a little slower when he gets by the boat. And he's walking a little slower than he was when he first came out. And as he gets slower and slower, the disciples see him and they say, hey, we need help. Call out to Christ. He's there. He's never left heaven, not once. He's there. Cry out to Him. So to have calmness in our life, we need Christ. We need to cry. But thirdly, in the calmness, there's a cease. Look at it with me in verse number 51, uh, part A. And he, went up into the, and he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. If you were to look over, turn, you know what, turn over with me to the book of John. The book of John, chapter number 6, let's just look at it. John 6, 21, this is where John gives the account of the story that we're reading in Mark, and you can also read it in Matthew. John, chapter number 6, let's just look at verse number 21 of that. John 6, 21. And then the Bible tells us, Then they willingly received him up into the ship, and immediately the ship 
or I'm sorry, and immediately, yeah, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. They said willingly they received him into the ship. And as he came into that ship, the storm stopped. And the next thing they know, they're on land, Brother Jeff. They were in the middle of the sea, toiling and rowing, and everything was contrary. But then as Christ gets into the ship, everything calms down. And as Jesus just says, guys, I'm here. They look up and they're on land. They're safe. Can I tell you today, if you're looking for Christ, He's willing to get into the ship with you. Sometimes the life, the boat that we're on in life, the seas are big. And the waves are crashing in on us. We can turn on the television right now and we can see that the waves are crashing in on a lot of people. And they're rowing and they're toiling in this world. And everything is going contrary to what they thought or what they, uh, they, what they fathomed would happen in their life and it's going contrary to what they thought. And they're out there and they're toiling. But can I tell you, Jesus is still walking out there. And He's still listening for somebody to call out His name. Can I tell you this? I absolutely cannot stand and would even say I hate Calvinism. I hate the Calvinistic thinking that I can get saved but my wife can't. Brother Hawk, you can get saved but your wife can't. I'm so sorry. God told me that you can get saved, but your wife can't. Bunch of hogwash. And how dare they tell anybody that they can't have salvation? Because my Bible tells me that it was free. The Bible tells me in John uh, chapter number 3, verse number 16, that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall call upon His name shall be saved. It doesn't say your neighbor might be saved, but you're definitely saved. No, 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 it says whosoever. That means everybody. That means Brother Hawk. That means Brother Elliot. That means Miss Alicia. That means Brother Joe. You got the same salvation that I got. I can't tell you if you're saved or not. And I can't tell you if you're saved or not. But I know about myself. But I can tell you this. It's a free gift. And whoever wants it, all we have to do is take it. I cannot stand that theology that they can have salvation, but they can't. And that denomination is sending so much people to hell by saying, you can't be saved. Can you imagine God in heaven as He looks over at that and He says, what? I came to earth and died so that all men can have free salvation and this is what you've made it out to be that so-and-so can get saved and so-and-so can't? How dare we? You know what? Brother Jeff, sometimes my heart gets hardened and that door that I knock on, and that guy throws me off his porch, something inside of me, I'm just being real honest with you tonight, something inside of me says, fine, die, go to hell and burn. I'm being honest with you. You know why? Because he upset me. But do you realize that his agony is so much more than mine? Not only does he have to live on this earth and not have the companion with Jesus like I have, the Holy Spirit living inside of me. He's my comforter. He comes beside me when I'm low. He doesn't have that, but now he's about to spend an eternity in a place called hell that is real, it's real, it's real. And as long as these lights are on and there's a pulpit up here, we'll preach that there's a hell and it's real, but there's also a heaven that we can escape hell. And you say, you really think that about some people? Sometimes, when they slam doors in my wife's face, yeah, I think that. You know why? Because I got the same flesh that you do. And even though you won't say it, I'll say it for you, you're thinking the same thing that I'm thinking. How dare they? But then as you begin to think about it, your heart breaks. Because they're in the storm of life. And just like these disciples, although these disciples knew Christ, they just seen Him perform miracles. Do you think that they knew that Christ, if they called out to Him, He would be there just like that? He was just up on a mountain praying. They were only four miles from Him. They hadn't gotten very far from Christ. And He was still with them because the Bible says He looked up and He saw Him. He saw them toiling and rowing. Christ is always there. You say, I'm really going through it. Uh, it seems like the storm of life is caving in on me. 
And I understand that it seems like a lot more nowadays that the storm of life is caving in on us. You say, but you're so young, Ellie. You haven't really gone through a lot. No, but I have gone through some things. And I do realize that we can rely on Christ. You know why? Because I read my Bible. And I see where He helps people who just call on Him. We find the story of Lazarus when He heals Lazarus. And they come to Him and they say, Jesus, you need to come. Lazarus is dying. I just read this story. and I don't know why the Lord put it upon my heart. They said, Lazarus is dying. You need to come. And the Bible tells us that Jesus tarried there. And as He tarried, Lazarus passed away. And as He hears word of Lazarus passing away, even though He already knew what was going to happen, He goes to the tomb where His friend lays. And the Bible tells us in the shortest verse, Jesus wept. His heart was broken. Jesus was going through a storm in His life. But I can imagine as Jesus would weep, He would call upon the One called God, His Heavenly Father. And he would say, God, this is really discouraging. But Lord, let your will be done. And he looked at that tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what happened, Miss Jackie? Lazarus came forth. But do you know why Jesus tarried his staying and did not come immediately when he knew that he was sick and healed him? You say, how could Jesus do that? Because Jesus had a bigger plan. Because the Bible tells us right after that story that all the Jews went to Mary and they believed on Jesus. See, had He gone, not all those people would have seen the miracle that Jesus performed. But as they saw Lazarus come forth from the dead, and the Bible tells us, lo, He stinketh. He had been dead a while. He stank. And as He came forth, those Jews said, oh my goodness, this really is the Messiah. This really is the guy that we've heard preached year after year after year that would come. As John would see him, he said, Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Oh, as he would see that man, and as these disciples are in the storm of their life, they're toiling, they're rowing, they don't know what's going to happen, they're crying out, Oh, maybe we're going to die. God comes walking by. Can I tell you today, America is in the storm of life, and Jesus is walking by rapidly. And we ought to look out and say, Jesus, help us. Jesus, come over. Can I tell you, He'll stop and He'll come. As a 12 or 13 year old boy, as I realized that I was going to hell, and as I uh, got on my knees, as Dr. Milam used to say, my mom got on one side and my dad got on the other, and Jesus got on the inside. I'm so glad that when I was going through the biggest storm of my life, Brother Hawk, Jesus was walking by and He heard my cry. Aren't you glad for that today? Man, the song that they sang about, it's the only blood that I need. Hey, Mohammed, he's dead. Buddha, he's dead. I'm sorry, they're all dead, but my God, he ever liveth. And can I tell you something? Hey, my God died too. But after three days, he arose from the grave. I just read in my daily Bible reading where they came to the tomb. My goodness, where they came to the tomb. And the Bible says as the sun came up, they began to speak and say, hey, how are we going to roll away such a big stone? we got to get somebody to help us roll away this stone. And as they came there, the stone was rolled away. And what they didn't know is as the sun was coming up, the sun had already risen. S-O-N. And man, as they came to that tomb, they went inside and the angel said, hey, whoa, don't be scared. He's risen. He told you he was going to rise. And they doubted him, but he was alive. My goodness, I serve a good God today. Can I tell you, the blood that saved people oh so long ago is the same blood that still saves today. And although people have watered down that blood, Brother Jeff, they've watered down the gospel. They've turned it into works. Can I tell you something? I've never had to work myself to heaven, and if I did, I'd be on my way to hell because I could never do anything. I don't have enough money in this world to pay myself into heaven. But can I tell you this much? God can take the poorest man and He can make him rich. God can take the guy with no land and He can give him land. You say, although I don't have it here on earth, I know that it's in heaven. Because the Bible tells me that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Oh, I'm so glad that someday, even though it seems like maybe my house isn't a mansion here, I know that someday I get to dwell with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good enough reason to get in right there. I don't need a mansion to get in. I just want to be with Him. I want to be with the guy 
who can calm the seas by saying the gentlest words. This is Jesus we're talking about. Maybe today you're going through a storm. I don't know. Maybe you're not, maybe you haven't told anybody that you're going through a storm. But can I tell you, call out to Jesus. He's walking by and he's saying, Oh, Elliot, call out to me, son. Call out to me. I'm here. As I was studying for this sermon, I was looking for a story or a fitting poem, and I came across this poem that I thought was good. And I am not, I cannot read poems. I don't know why. I'm just not a poet, Brother Jeff. I'm not a Shakespeare or a Spear. I'm nothing. I'm not good at poems, so if I butcher it, I'm sorry, but you listen. He never fails the soul that trusts in him. Though disappointments come and hope burns dim, he never fails. Though trials surge like stormy seas around, though testings fierce like ambush foes around, yet this my soul with millions more has found, he never fails, he never fails. He never fails the soul that trusted him. Though angry skies with thunder clouds grow grim, he never fails. Though icy blasts like fairest flowers lay low, though earthly springs of joy all cease to flow, yet still and is, tis true, with millions more I know, he never fails, he never fails. He never fails the soul that trusted him. Though sorrow's cup should overflow the brim, he never fails. Though off the pilgrim way seems rough and long, I yet shall stand amid yon white robed throng. Can I tell you to this tonight? All the things that we put our hope in, they fail. But can I tell you one person that you can put all your hope, you can put all your treasures into, is Jesus Christ. He will not fail you. Just as this, just as this poet said, He's never failed. And these disciples learned something that day. That when they're going through the hardest time of their life, when they're going through a storm, Jesus never fails. And as they are toiling and rowing, here He comes. And He gets in the ship with them. And if you were to read it in the book of Matthew, Peter goes out onto that water and he loses sight of Christ. They just keep falling back into that same rut that they kept falling into when they lost faith in Him. And I'm not telling you today that I have 100%, I have 100% faith. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying sometimes I lose faith in God and I should not. Sometimes I let the things of this world dictate to me how I trust Christ when it should not be that way. I should trust Christ and let things happen that happen and let them roll right off you. You say, that's hard to do. I know. I know. Look around here. Everybody in here has something that has broken their hearts. You know, you can turn on the TV and you can hear story after story about uh, people who are abandoned as children or this and that. You do realize that every crack that we get in our heart molds us into the people that we are today. I'm not saying that I always understand the storms that we go through in life, but I do understand that they get us to where we are in life and leading more upon Him. Trust in the Lord. As Pastor put it this morning in Sunday school, if you missed it, you missed a good one. And he did it last week. Trust the Lord. That seemed like that became the theme of our tent meeting. Just trust the Lord. Hey, this world is not getting better. The politicians are not getting any better. It doesn't matter who gets into the White House. It doesn't matter if she gets elected or if he gets elected. Things are not going to change unless we Christians stand up with the Word of God in our hands and we say that's sin and we're not going to do it. It doesn't matter what happens in this world. We need to trust in Christ. He's quickly walking by us on the sea of life. And we're too busy looking the other way at so many other things. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Can I tell you today, He'll never fail you. He will never fail you. Don't let Jesus pass you by today. You say, I don't know if I'm saved. If you'll come at the invitation, I will personally have somebody or myself show you that you can know 100% without a shadow of a doubt because the Word of God tells me that you can be 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven. Brother Jack, you got that settled last a couple of weeks ago. Praise the Lord for that. You know what? There, is pe there will be people who will say, huh, thought he was a church member. Tithe? 
did everything right, and he gets saved, who cares what they say? I'm glad that you made assurance because I can't do it for you. And you know what, Brother Jack? I want to spend an eternity with you. I want you to be in on the same things that I get to be in on. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. It's just as easy as calling out to Him. And He'll get into the ship and He'll calm the storm of life. I didn't say that all storms will cease. Not every storm for these disciples ceased. But this storm that they were going through ceased because they called upon the One who made those seas, who made those winds, who made that storm, that very storm that they were in. Christ made that storm many years before they were ever even thought of. That's Jesus today. You say, I'm saved, I know it, I'm good. Maybe you're going through a storm. Jesus is there, trust Him. Trust Him. He's never left my side. He is not one to forsake His own. He's not. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, the Bible tells me. He is such a friend. I serve such a big God today. Although sometimes I set my expectations way above what He wants, He still fulfills them to somewhat degree. Although He doesn't fulfill them to mine, He fulfills them to what He wants. And it makes me a better Christian. Although I don't understand it, He does it for my good. He's so good. He's such a simple, perfect, holy God that I can serve Him today. He's so good. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Remember that. When you're going through something, just remember, He's not left your side. He didn't leave His disciples' side. Even though He sent them away, He went up into a mountain and was praying and was overlooking them. Because it says He looked up and He saw His disciples. He was over them. He was watching over them. He was praying for them. And then He was with them. When they were going through the deepest, darkest sorrows, pains of their life out there in that sea, He was with them. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful for the Word of God.